It's hard to believe that as of October 19th, 2020, Fallout New Vegas is officially 10 years old. I think that technically makes it a retro game, I don't make the rules. Despite its age, New Vegas has never even left my rotation of games for long enough to feel like I was going back to it, even after a decade has passed, and I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. You wouldn't know it from this channel, but I mostly play new games, even though I don't cover them as often since so many others already do. So when I say I've played through this game at least once annually for the past decade, that's an achievement that only three or four other games even vie for. I love this game, if that's not obvious enough, but I'm not blind to its flaws. In fact, when it first came out, I had a laundry list of complaints, particularly before a slew of patches came out. In this video, I'm going to cover the obvious strong points, why this game is so infinitely replayable, while acknowledging the parts that newcomers may not appreciate. I'll be the first to tell you. New Vegas is not for everyone, even if it is arguably the perfect game for the right player. But first, allow me to reminisce about the New Vegas hype season of 2010. You should know that I was a massive fan of Fallout 3. Coming off of Oblivion and seeing that formula set to a whole new setting, especially one that was so charming and visually striking with all the moral crossroads, rich irony, and retro futurism, it was so enamoring to me. It was during this time that my love for freeform western RPGs, which had started with Morrowind, was consuming and defining my taste like just about nothing had before. So naturally, when I saw the New Vegas teaser, only about 15 months after the launch of Fallout 3, the hype cycle began with all pistons firing. In spring 2010, I specifically remember waking up early to make a stop at Walmart on my way to school because this issue of PC gaming was set to hit the shelves, which had the first screenshots of New Vegas. That NCR armor is still probably my favorite armor in any game. What a bamf. As old as this magazine is, the cover still reeks of badassery. You can probably smell it through your monitor right now. I also remember seeing the first screenshots of the actual game and thinking, wait, what? This looks exactly like Fallout 3. It's practically a mod. It even had the same Pip-Boy with the same fingerprint on it. In fact, most of the assets had been copied and pasted from Fallout 3. It's funny to see people lambast games these days for being asset flips, which is understandable, but one of the most revered RPGs of all time happens to be exactly that, and no one seems to mind. At the time, it was a little disappointing that there was no leap in graphical fidelity from its predecessor, but nonetheless, the game looked promising with a fresh western open road aesthetic that contrasted nicely with the bleak nuclear holocaust of Fallout 3. I find both flavors profoundly awesome for the record. The more I learned about the game, the more I wanted it, and my hype overflowed on a level that I've consciously avoided ever since. Don't get me wrong, I cherish a good hype season. But any of my friends at the time would testify that I would not shut the f*** up about this game. I even managed to procure this sick post from GameStop's window when they were done with it, which I put on my bedroom wall at the time. I was somewhat of a closet nerd, whereas now I'm more of a flaming nerd. The New Vegas Collector's Edition might make you hate today's Collector's Editions. It came in a custom weathered case that opened up to a hand-drawn graphic novel that follows Benny and the Cons. It covers the events leading up to their assault on the player character in the game's intro. Several mementos and scenes can be found in the game that only make sense if you've read the graphic novel. It also included a making of DVD, poker chips from the casinos you can visit in the game, including the platinum chip. It even came with a deck of cards, but not just any deck of cards. Each card has a high fidelity, hand-drawn rendering of an in-game character who corresponds to the card's rank. This played so nicely into the game's themes. Who will you befriend? Who will you eliminate? And who might stand in your way? It's all about your ability to play your cards right. All of this, by the way, was 80 bucks. Compare that to some of today's collector's editions that are upward of $200 and sometimes don't even include a physical copy of the game. This version is the uh, remote controlled version, which will cost you roughly around $200. Ugh. <gasps> Aha, we found it. Where? Game not included. You wouldn't know it by the overwhelming praise New Vegas receives today, but on the major review sites, it consistently scored lower than Fallout 3. 
and Fallout 4 for that matter, the initial consensus of this game was not, wow, best RPG of all time. It was more like, oh, more Fallout 3, huh? I remember feeling very alone as a Fallout fan altogether. Obviously, lots of Fallout fans were out there, but I didn't know many. It wasn't until about five years later that I started noticing people talking about these games like they were masterpieces. At the Video Game Awards, Fallout 3 lost Game of the Year to GTA 4, while New Vegas wasn't even nominated. Just a clarification, I'm talking about Game of the Year. It was nominated for Best RPG, but it lost to Mass Effect 2. And while I love New Vegas, there are a few reasons I can see why it would take fans a little while to come around to it. First of all, I'm gonna get this out of the way. When New Vegas launched, it was probably the buggiest game I had ever played. Just weird errors that were constant, like vats freezing up or just weird rendering failures. But the vast majority of that got patched, so I won't get into all that. More importantly, New Vegas just isn't the sort of game that clicks right away. For a game that looks so much like Fallout 3, it surprisingly feels very different. It's not a safe assumption that someone who likes one would like the other. Even though they share so many assets, they surprisingly differ a great deal in their aesthetic directions, as well as how they balance stats with action. On the combat front, Fallout 3 was never very slick outside of VATS, but those issues are somewhat exacerbated in New Vegas because of how devoted it is to stat accentuation. For example, a character with high damage resistance and endurance is likely to survive several shotgun blows to the face. which on the one hand means stats definitely matter. That is one of the obvious marks of a great RPG after all, but to some players that stat integrity will be outweighed by some of the resulting moments of absurdity that make it hard to suspend your disbelief as you brace that clunky, somewhat undercooked combat. Fallout 3 avoided some of these situations, but at the cost of some balance. As someone who was expecting basically Fallout 3 but in Vegas, it took me a good little while to realize what this game offered that I would come to appreciate and even revere so passionately. It has such an unparalleled capacity to bend and mold itself to your decisions that you really can't feel the full effect before you've tried a few different builds as well as siding with different factions. Every faction can be joined, pissed off, or altogether slaughtered. The big ones like NCR or Caesar's Legion will keep coming from their western and eastern home fronts respectively, but you are free to eliminate them one by one upon encountering them as you are with any NPC, the sole exceptions being children. This means that even the most critically relevant characters like Caesar of Caesar's Legion or Mr. House who runs the Vegas Strip can be eliminated without any quest or prerequisite apart from physically reaching them. Whatever you do, the game will adapt accordingly, often with dramatically varying results. When you make the wrong enemies, they don't forget, and often they will track you down and find you. Maybe they'll give you a warning, or maybe they'll give you a bullet in the back of the head. Living on the run in this game is no joke. NPCs have just as much agency as you do. Likewise, the friends you make will offer commodities like gear, shelter, or fire support, and whoever you affiliate with, whoever you help or piss off or kill for that matter, this game holds you to a strict standard of permanence. Sure, there are opportunities for redemption sprinkled in, but those are few and far between. New Vegas forces you to commit to your decisions in the best way possible. Not only are they typically irreversible, but they're far more consequential than you'd find in other games. They don't just change the dialogue or story sequences, they legitimately void entire quest lines. Most veteran RPG fans appreciate this massively because it means the experience they got was really tailored to their build and choices, and really, why have choices if they don't make a real difference? New Vegas is one of the purest manifestations of a narrative that branches and molds. There are fundamental points of commonality that everyone will encounter, like the Strip itself, a handful of moral crossroads, and of course the Battle of Hoover Dam, but everything in between makes up a narrative labyrinth that sees every player to a different permutation. This incentivizes a second playthrough, and a third, and fourth, and fifth, and I think what I love the most is that these crossroads have no clear right answer. Even in hindsight, by design, many of these situations are moral enigmas that make great fodder for debate. 
Apart from Caesar's Legion, who are clearly evil, all of the big factions have moral ambiguity. NCR have good intentions, but seem to expand their authority to no limit, even in places where they're clearly not wanted by those they seek to govern. Mr. House is definitely cold in how he oversees the Strip, but he is the only reason the Strip wasn't obliterated. Without him, it would just be another block of rubble, and at least no one is forced to remain in his jurisdiction. You can take matters into your own hands, but that does mean putting the others into harm's way. It's not clear that all of them deserve that. It's as if you have to try every which way to properly experience the breadth of this game's contents, and that's without getting into all the smaller factions like the Cons, the Brotherhood of Steel, Freeside, and so on. To many of us, this range of permutations is precisely what makes this such an amazing RPG. It differentiates endlessly and just keeps giving. The thing is, a lot of modern players don't want to do multiple playthroughs. Many, or I'd venture to say, even most of today's RPG players become attached to one playthrough, and the thought of missing out on quests and bulks of content because they're locked into their decisions just gives them anxiety and turns them off from the experience. You might notice that Skyrim, probably the most popular popular western RPG never locks the player out of anything as a result of their decisions. You can complete all guilds simultaneously with any build. I'm not saying Skyrim is bad. With my log of hours in that game, I would have to be a moron to say I didn't like it. But in a lot of ways, New Vegas is more reminiscent of Morrowind with how it handles your commitments. It's not afraid to tell you no, say if you have the wrong build for a certain task. But New Vegas applies this same philosophy to exemplify its namesake. Fallout is named not just for the actual radioactive particles that appear after a nuclear explosion, but also for the figurative fallout of one's decisions. I know that sort of, I'm 14 and this is deep, but once upon a time, I was 14 and that sh was deep. As its namesake implies, Fallout New Vegas is a game of cause and effect. As you learn the web of chain reactions and wield all of it to your liking, every succeeding playthrough is informed by the last and then revised on both a moral and strategic level. When you first start, it seems like there's only one viable route to Vegas without becoming Deathclaw Chow. It's this obtuse loop that winds south and then comes all the way back up and even further. When you finally get to Vegas, you likely won't have the money to get into the strip and you have to work your way up in society until you have the money or reputation to get in. Whereas someone who really knows their sh can find a stealth boy in the tutorial area, sneak by those death claws, pick an NCR disguise off a corpse, which allows them to take a monorail onto the strip, no questions asked. I've had playthroughs where I reached the strip and took out Benny all in under 30 minutes. Of course, knowing where to go and what items to snag might be half the battle, but it's also about making the right stat investments. I hate to bring up Skyrim again, I love it, but one of its weaknesses is that some of its skills are just not worth investing in. Take lockpicking. I've never understood why anyone would waste a perk point on this skill. Right out the gate, you can pick any master lock with a handful of lockpicks and enough patience. Yes, it's harder when you're at a low level and the perks definitely help, but if you're just careful and patient, you ultimately get the same reward. No perks necessary, no skill level necessary, you just have to be willing to take your time, seriously, save your perks for something else. In New Vegas, on the other hand, even the passive skills have incredibly lucrative and rewarding moments that cannot be unlocked without a dedicated investment. For example, if you befriend Caesar's Legion, there comes a point where Caesar needs brain surgery. With the right medical skills, you can remove his brain tumor, or you can rig the surgery to go fatally wrong before using charisma to convince Caesar's men that despite your best efforts, nothing could be done to save him. You can literally kill Caesar right in front front of all of them without losing their trust. There are some insane results that can happen when you play a very cleverly passive hand. Naturally, New Vegas is about a 30 hour game. Some people stretch that to 70 or 100 hours, but I once completed the game in under 4 hours without ever even equipping a weapon, just using speech, science, medicine, and so on to play my cards carefully. I didn't use any cheats or exploits, and quite honestly, I wouldn't say I was speedrun 
running either, just thinking ahead about my moves and fast traveling liberally. But I wouldn't recommend approaching the game that way. You'll have a much better time if you take your time to wrestle with the moral enigmas, get to know the companions, and appreciate the atmosphere. New Vegas is great proof of that old adage, the journey beats the destination. It really emulates a road trip complete with landmarks, roadside attractions, campsites, rest stops with friends to make or even recruit, motels to spend the night at, souvenir shops, the wide open road with all the vibrant billboards that evoke that classic Route 66 aesthetic, and of course, those tantalizing lights that encrust the horizon with gleaming prismatic wanderlust. It's like a Christmas tree all year round. And when you finally make it to the strip, it really does feel like stepping into another world. There's this great juxtaposition between the wasteland and this beacon of luxury behind the walls. It feels very alive. Everywhere you look pops out with lights that lure you to one attraction or another like flower petals to a bee. And the casinos are similarly decked out with gaudy cosmetic themes and color palettes, and of course it goes far beyond the look. You might win it big or get comped a suite. Maybe you fall in with the mob or stumble upon some rabbit hole down the wrong hallway. But at this point, I'm just rattling off features left and right, and that could take all night. So however you feel about New Vegas among the Fallout series, it definitely offers something that the others don't. And I'd argue that's true on some level for all of them. Fallout 3 has its own advantages, but of course, that's gotta be its own video one day. Even though I find myself playing New Vegas the most consistently, I play them all for different reasons, and I get very different satisfactions out of each one. I can't say which one is truly best, but it's not this one, or this one. Actually, how about that one just never even existed? That's the new rule. Moving on, it's okay to love them all, even if that includes Fallout 76. Frankly, I'd be really upset to lose any of them, so happy birthday to New Vegas. Thank you, Obsidian, for the past decade of great trips through the Mojave. And here's hoping Obsidian and Fallout now being under the same roof means New Vegas will get a more direct sequel one of these days. If you enjoyed this content, check out my other videos. Your like and or sub would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.